Lord. Let's open up our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. You know, as I'm sitting here worshiping with you guys, I was just taken back. I remember back in 93, I was sitting way back there, and David Rosales gave a message on the crucifixion of Christ. And I remember, man, just um, a brother named Robert Garcia, man. Uh, he just went to be home with the Lord last week. Um, I know that um, it, it really shocked me because he was my age. And, and he's the one that invited me to come to church. And I actually came hoping that if I, I come, he would leave me alone. I, honestly, I really thought he was trying to pick up on Sonia. And, and my jealousy led to telling him, hey, bro, you're no longer welcome here, you know, at our house. Uh, we know what you believe. You know what? Uh, let's just leave it like that. Don't come back. And he's all like, all right, cool. No worries. But come to church with me then. And then my mind is saying, okay. He comes, he goes, hey, that's awesome, you know, I got him out of the picture. And, and I was sitting back there when Rosales, pastor, my pastor, gave an altar call. And he turns to me and says, David, if you want to go, I'll go with you. And I say, Charles, I'm going on my own, I say, and I walked up. <laughs> and I was standing right here. And, uh, and, and I remember Rosales, you know, after the sinner's prayer, he looked and down and he said, welcome to the family of God. And, and I remember crying. And, and ever since then, man, um, I've been serving God, you know. Uh, through the good and through the bad. So a lot of memories right here. But I want to start out by saying that, you know, just to kind of give, uh, give uh, some props to Robert Garcia. Um, he, he took us in and, and, and we were raw, man. We were cursing and smoking, throwing the smoke in his face, bagging on him. When we got saved, you know, we didn't change overnight, you know, but he was so loving. He was so gracious. Uh, he was willing to go out of his way just so that we can come to church, you know. And, and so he set the pattern of our walk with God. And, and I even bought an astrovan like him so I can pick up people to come to church. And, and, and I'll tell you this. He was, in the beginning of my walks with, with God, uh, kind of like a, a hero for me, in a sense. Because he showed me how to walk my Christian walk. He, and, and, and he set the pattern, like as I mentioned. And from that point on, the Lord just began to work in my life, and, and I had someone that I can look to and say, preach the gospel, read the word, you know, and trust God. And, and just watching him, I, I would say, to me, he was a, a very influential and, and a blessing. So now he's with the Lord, and I, you know what, and I'm, and, I'm so, and, I, and I'm blessed to know that one day we'll be reunited and hang out in heaven. And I can picture Robert, he'll be bragging once we get there. But, but I will tell you this, in our faith... There's going to be people in your life that are going to influence you. These people are champions of the faith. You know, I, I know that um, during the beginning, I used to look up to Raw and, and Pancho Juarez, and especially David Rosales, my pastor. And these were guys that, man, that really shaped my life. And, and then from that, you know, Chuck Smith and, and so forth. But, but as I began to read the Bible, other people, <laughs> other brothers in the Bible began to win my heart. Like the Apostle Paul. I mean, I think that guy was down. You know what I mean? This guy, you know, they stone him, beat him up, leave him half dead, and he still gets up and goes preach, preaches, right? You're like, man, that guy's crazy. That guy, that's what I want to be. Then you have Peter, and then you have all these apostles. But you go a little bit further back, you come to a man by the name of Noah, right? Noah was another guy that had a, a faith of a champion. In fact, his faith... Uh, was so recognized that he made it to what is called the hall of faith, right, in, in, in chapter 11 of Hebrews. So again, there are many in the Bible that we can say that had great faith, or should I say they were champions of faith. Uh, and, and this individual here, uh, Noah, was one who, who we can say was a champion of faith. This individual, no, uh, Noah, had what is called an unsinkable faith. You know what I'm saying? He had an unsinkable faith in times of trials and treacherous, treacherous times. In fact, this man displayed his faith and his faithfulness in a time where it was hard, seeing the times that he was living in. And we're going to look at his life today and point out some, some things that we can apply to our lives so that we too can become those champions of faith. Amen? So let's go ahead and have our, we have our Bibles turned to Hebrews chapter 11. Why don't we stand together just because I, like, I love that power having you sit and stand. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> I just want to give reverence to the Word of God. That's all it is. So let's go ahead and read in verse 7. Here we go. 
By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of the things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. And Father, we come before you and we ask that you would just speak to our hearts, convict us, encourage us, Lord, uh, strengthen us, whatever it is, Lord God, we need you to meet us today so that we can leave this place better prepared and also challenged to exercise our faith, Lord, in obedience to your word. Lord, we want to be more like your son, uh, who's the ultimate one, Father, that we want to copy or, or, or copy our lives with, Lord. So now we ask that you would just help us to not to get distracted with, you know, our, our social media alerts, Lord, or, or scores or whatever it might be, Father, or anything. Just help us just to have uh, our attention, just focus upon you as we hear with an ear to hear. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we say, amen. You may have a seat. So Noah, for, uh, I'll give you a, a few things so you can jot these down. Number one, Noah had a faith that believed God's warnings. Notice again, it says in verse 7, By faith Noah being divinely warned of the things not yet seen. So he had a faith that believed the warnings of God. God has spoken to Noah and he warned him of the, of the judgment that was coming, of the flood that was coming. Now prior to the flood, as Genesis chapter 2 verses 5 through 6 tells us, God watered the, the earth by springs, rivers, and by evaporation, con con condensation, and dew. But I want you to know that God warned Noah of something he had never seen before. It didn't rain before, right? So God is telling him, guess what? I'm going to destroy the world. And Noah had to have the faith to believe. So again, God warned Noah something that he had never seen before, as we just read. Noah had a warning from the word. He had the word of God. And listen to what I'm about to say. If you want to have that champion, of, that faith of a champion, is this, God gives warnings, and we need to have the faith to believe them. Are you hearing me? God gives warnings, and we have to have the faith to believe. In fact, he warns us, of num uh, this is another point, of the consequences of sin. The consequences of sin. If you turn your Bible to Galatians chapter 6, turn there right quickly. And can you exaggerate a little bit by flipping the pages so I can and encourage me that you guys are turning there? Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, the Apostle Paul wrote this in verse 7. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Did I say something wrong? <laughs> Here we go. It says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he was so to the spirit, will of the spirit reap everlasting life. But notice he warns us, he says, don't be deceived. Don't fool yourselves, is what he's saying. You cannot make a mockery of our creator. He says, if you, if you, and he goes on to say, look, for whatever a man sows that, he will also weep. In scripture, the Bible tells us that sin leads to death. That's a warning, telling us to avoid sin, because sin comes with consequences. And I've said this before, you know, you can choose sin, but you can't choose the consequences. And sin lasts but for a moment. But the consequences, you don't know how long that's going to last. You see what I'm saying? And God tells us over and over in his word to walk in holiness, to walk in the light, to walk pleasing him. He's telling us to walk in a way in, 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 in which it's, it's, it's going to keep us from sinning against not only ourselves, but against God. Because when we sin, expect the consequences, and God will use the consequences to get your attention, right? To get you to understand that what you're doing is wrong. So it's important for us to understand that God will warn us of the consequence of sin. Now, do you believe that? Do you believe that? Because if you do, you're not going to do the things that you know you shouldn't be doing. Like getting on some websites, right, that are not right. Flirting. When you're married, at work with the secretary, or, or I don't know, um, you know, gangbanging while you're still a Christian. I've seen it. <laughs> Drinking, getting drunk, getting high, and excusing it by saying, oh, it's just medicine, you know, medicine, it's a medicine ball, whatever, right? 
The point that I'm trying to say is, listen, you play with fire, you're going to get burned. And you're only going to inflict pain and misery to your own life. God loves you so much that he warns you. But you got to believe his warnings. You have to have the faith to believe that when God says this is going to happen if you do this, that he will do it. So again, number one in that particular point there, uh, um, uh, God gives us warnings as well. Now, he warned us of the, of the danger of constantly rejecting him. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13, we also read this. You must warn each other every day while it is still today, so that none of you will be deceived by the sin and, and hardened against God, as another translation reads, the New Living Translation. There's a danger of, con of constantly rejecting Jesus Christ. God warns us of that. If you're here today for the first time, listen to me, or you're watching online, and you know about God, and, and, and you've been given the opportunity to respond to the gospel. You've been given, you know, um, some insight into what God did for you on the cross. If you reject them and you continue to reject them, you are in danger of hardening your heart towards the things of God. And ultimately, God will say, listen, then not my will be done, but your will be done. And we see that perfectly illustrated in the life of Pharaoh. If you read the story in Exodus chapter 9, you're going to see how constantly God kept, you know, telling, you know, uh, through Moses, let my people go. And it says, and Pharaoh hardened his heart. And again, Pharaoh, uh, Moses goes to Pharaoh, let my people go. God said, let my people go. And Pharaoh hardened his heart. And, and finally, you'll get to a place where God says, then God hardened the heart of Pharaoh. You can get to the point of no return. Because one thing you're going to uh, learn in your constant rejection of God is this. The more you do it, the better you're going to get at it. And if you're a Christian, you can also reject the Holy Spirit by disobeying his word. So it's important that you understand, guys, listen, that God warns us, number one, uh, he, uh, God gives us warnings. You have to have faith to believe it. And number two, he also warns us of the danger of constantly rejecting Christ. Do you believe that? <laughs> that you can get hardened toward the things of the Lord. And at one time when you heard the gospel and it moved you, the next time you hear it, it's not going to move you. It's going to push you further away from him. And I've said this before. It's kind of like when someone comes and tells you and talks about Jesus for the first time, right? You were like, oh, man, he did that for me. Your heart is moved by it. And you go home and you think about it. The next time someone comes along and tells you the same message, you'll be like, oh, yeah, man, that's, that's cool. Yeah, you know what? I I'll be there one day. Right. And then another person, maybe a few years later, comes back and tells you and shares the gospel again. Now you're saying, yeah, yeah, I, I get it. I, I've heard it before. And then let's say maybe another six months or another year, someone comes and shares the gospel again. Now you're saying, oh, I, I, I respect you guys, you know, and whatever. And then finally, someone comes up to you and says, hey, they wants to share the gospel with you. And you're kind of running away from them like you'll do a Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> right. <laughs> Little do you realize that you progressed in your rejection of God. So he warns us, right, about the consequences of sin. He warns us of constantly rejecting God. And here's another thing. He also warns us of the dangers of dying without Christ. Those are warnings. I mean, in fact, Matthew 5, 22, Matthew 10, 28, Matthew 25, 26, all talks about how Jesus talked about hell. And, and there's so many scriptures, man, where you'll find hell being talked about. Because hell is a real place. Hell is where people go who die without Jesus Christ. There's people in hell right now who died rejecting Jesus. You know, the other, last time I was here, I gave a study regarding the rich young ruler. Remember that for those who were here? And I said something like this. I said, listen, this guy was talking with Jesus. Jesus got into a hard and hard conversation with him told him what he needed to do to follow him, and he walked away sorrowful. And then I said, and Jesus didn't go after him. And then I said something like this. Think about it. He left, leaving behind Jesus Christ. And then I said, hey, can you imagine if he's right now in hell? Think about what he's thinking. Right now, if the rich man, young ruler is in hell right now, right now, don't you think that conversation that had, he had with Christ is playing in his mind and will continue to play in his mind until the day he's released from hell to stand at the great white throne judgment 
of, of, you know, of the unbelievers. And then he'll plead and beg, and then he'll be thrown right into Gehenna. Think about that for a moment. So God warns us about hell, and he tells us the extent that he went so that you don't have to go to hell. You can go to heaven and be with the Lord forever and, 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 be, and experience true joy and peace. You know, I mean, we're experiencing now those who have a relationship with the Lord, but greater peace and greater joy, man, because we're literally in a place where Christ is present forevermore. And that's what makes heaven heaven. But can you imagine? That's why Jesus, when he went to the cross, it was a serious act of love because hell is serious. So he warns us again. He, he warns us about the consequences of sin. He war- well, the Scripture warns us about, you know, the, con- um, um, the constant rejecting of, rejection of Christ and also warns us of hell. Now, here's the question. Do you have faith or do you believe those warnings? Because if you do, listen to me, it's going to change the way you live. It's going to change the way you live. If I tell you right now, hey, they're going to drop a bomb in this building in the next 10 minutes. If you believe that, you're going to act on it. You know what I'm saying? You're going to get up and you're going to run out of this building because you believe it. So if I'm telling you, listen, this is what God says. Consequences will do, the same would do this. And not only that, you constantly reject God. This is what's going to happen. And if you die without Christ, then this is what's going to happen. If you believe that, if you really have that faith, it's going to change your life. And then you, how about if you're someone who's already received Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior? Well, you're not going to sin because you know that even if you're a believer, you're still going to suffer the consequences of the choices that you make that go against God's word. And even though you're not going to go to hell, but you can think like this. Listen, maybe my actions will push people further away from the gospel because you're being a false witness and they may, they may end up in hell. Never thought about it like that? You see, when you believe the warnings of God, it's going to change the way you live. It's going to change the way you live. Please understand that. Now, here's another thing that I want you to know. So, first, Noah had faith that believed God's warning. Number two, Noah had faith that did the work of God. Notice again, as we turn back to Hebrews chapter 11. It says, by faith, being divinely warned of the things not yet seen... Move with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household. Notice that. So again, he had a faith that moved him to work. So after hearing from God, Noah went to work. God's word teaches us that faith without works is dead in James chapter 2, verse 20. So God told Noah to build an ark, and what did Noah do? He obeyed it. Why did he obey? Because he believed what God said. See, when you believe, you're going to obey. In fact, listen for you note takers. The word believe comes from an old English word, uh, by live. So what we believe, (laughs) we live by. What we believe, we live by. So if, if you really believe God, right, and everything that he said in this book, you're going to apply it to your life. You're going to apply it to your life. You're going to do it. If God says, don't worry. Through the lips of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You're not going to worry, right? You say, Lord, it's in your hands, right? If God tells you, go and preach the gospel, you're going to go and you're going to preach the gospel. If God tells you, you know, serve the widows or serve the orphans or, or go or be on mission, whatever it is, you're going to do it. Here, let me break it down even more. God tells you, husbands, love your wife that Christ loved the church. You're going to do it. Grow up with your wife with understanding. You're going to do it because you believe his word. So here's the thing. God tells us to do things, and because we have faith in him, it's going to lead to works. It's going to show it by the way we live. So don't say that you have faith if you don't obey. We have to obey when, even when we don't understand. The word believe means to trust. So you have faith, that faith to believe, to trust in God, even when he tells you to do something that it doesn't make sense. I mean, do you really think that Think about it. It hadn't rained yet. And God tells them, build an ark. (laughs) You know, judgment is coming. He's never experienced rain in his life. And yet he believed God that he was moved with godly fear to do what God told him to do. So even when it doesn't make sense, you still have to believe. And you still have to do it. 
You know, I've seen, uh, we, me and my wife counsel a lot of marriages, man. And one of the things that we highly emphasize is, do you believe God? Do you believe his word? You know, if they would just listen to what the word of God says and obey the word of God, their marriage would be restored. It's that simple. You know, so if you want to go see a counselor and pay high money, give it to me. I'll just tell you that same thing. <laughs> Psalms 1-1, man, right? It's that simple. But you're going to do it because you believe, because you have faith that God's going to do it, even when it doesn't make sense. Lord, you want me to love this woman or love this man, you know, when he's horrible. He's, you know, he's constantly giving me attitude. You know, he's lazy. You know, he never gives me rose or whatever it might be. And God would say, yeah. Yeah, I do. Okay, God, I don't see what you see, but I trust you. And, and, then, and then, you know what's the, the beauty of it? That in due time, when God does, through that person, what he wants to do in you, and finally he opens that person's eyes, and then you see that person getting closer to God, as you're close with God, you're going to be like, oh, my goodness, this is awesome. It was worth it. But a lot of us don't want to do the work. A lot of us don't want to do it. So what happens? We jump ship. We don't believe God. So we don't put to action what God tells us to do. I've said this before. Obedience is the key to Christianity. <laughs> is that simple, man? There's no, you know, the special, you know, things that you have to do. It's very simple. Just obey. Obey God. Believe his word. Obey it. And you're going you're gonna to see the blessings of it. So, again, we have to learn to believe God. And trust God and obey God even when we don't understand. As mentioned, he hadn't seen a flood, but he had a word from the Lord, and he obeyed it. I like what Warren Wisby said when he wrote, quote, Faith is obeying God in spite of circumstances or consequences. Hear me? He said, Faith is obeying God in spite of circumstances or consequences. You're just going to obey the Lord. And you're going to do it. So I want you to know that true faith is not an intellectual belief. It's actually belief with legs on. <laughs> you hear me? It's, a, it's belief with legs on. Someone wrote this, quote, It's not what you eat. It's what you digest that makes you strong. It's not what you gain. It's what you save that makes you rich. It's not what you read, but what you remember that makes you learned. It's not what you preach but what you practice that makes you a true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's true. <laughs> Guys, listen to me, man. Your faith needs legs. You need to put to action by obeying God's word. I promise you, with the, by the authority of the word of God, that if you do it, you're going to see it. And it's only going to help you live out a life of appreciation to God. But, but a lot of people never get there because they don't believe and they don't obey. And you're still dealing with the same problems you were dealing with like 10 years ago. You know what I'm saying? Don't you get tired? Don't you get tired of trying to do it your way? Get out of the way. Do it God's way. And then you're going to see the blessings behind it. Amen? Now, here's another thing that I want you to know. So the first thing, Noah had faith that believed God, as we read. Noah had faith that did the work of God. And now note this, Noah had a faith that was moved by godly fear. The godly fear that he had towards God moved him to action. Notice it says he was moved with godly fear. Noah revered God, but also feared God. See, you have to understand that a lot of us, we use the word fear and we talk about, oh, we got to respect God and give him the honor and the praise that he's worthy. And amen, we have to give him the praise and the glory. Amen, we have to respect him as king of kings and Lord of lords, not like my homeboy or none of that. He's God, creator of the world. He's our Lord, our master. We revere him. And we should. But we also have to fear him as the consuming fire. You hear me? Uh, the Bible talks about that God is like consuming fire in Deuteronomy 4.24. He's consuming fire. What does that mean? That means that God is also just and he will bring about judgment. A lot of us don't like that part of God. We like all the, you know, the, the good things, you know, that God is good. And God is loving. God is, you know, wants to bless. Yes. But if you're not obeying him, then you, sheer, you should fear God. Because you're going to end up not being blessed, but being a mess 
in a sense that, you, you know, you're suffering the consequences of the choices that you made that go against God's will. You should fear the Lord, you know. I'm going through something right now, me and my family. And, and, and to, you know, and me and my wife had a conversation, you know, and I, and I was telling her, you know, just to keep it very vague and simple. Like, you know what, man, it's crazy. I told her, and I'm just paraphrasing. I said, I want to do this. I want to hurt people. <laughs> Not you guys, you know, just the situation. People involved in the situation. You know what I mean? I, I, I want to hurt them. I want to get them back. I said, you know something? I said, you know what? They're lucky that I'm walking in the spirit because the day that I stop walking in the spirit, they're not going to love me. They're not going to like me. And then I told son, you know what? I think if I ever backslide, I said, God will take me home because I know how to live righteously. You know what I'm saying? And wickedly combined. Ooh, man, the wisdom in that. I said, God will take me home. But I'll tell you this. But I said something like this. But you know something? What keeps me is from doing what I want to do is a fear of the Lord. I said, I fear God. And I don't want him to, to, to take me home just yet. There's too many souls to win, too many people to reach, too many people to help. But I'm telling you, that's what's keeping me, not only of, of, of reverence for, the, of, of, you know, the, that reverence for God, but that fear that God will punish me. In Hebrews, it talks about that, right? Like a father disciplines his child. I don't want God to spank me. He has a big hand. <laughs> You know what I mean? So, so, I, but see, I believe that. I believe that there's the consequences of sins are a means that God uses to discipline us, to get us back on track. I, I, I believe that. I mean, have you read the God of the Old Testament? How he dealt with the people? You know what's up. So think about that. Guess what? God hasn't changed. I wonder... Why America's falling apart if God finally said, okay, you want to play that game? No problem. Play it. I'll let you do what you want to do. Romans talks about that. Chapter 1. And, and now we're reaping the consequences. We're, you know, we're reaping the consequences. But anyways, my point that I'm trying to make is this. That godly fear will move you to obey God. If you genuinely have a godly fear, if you revere him, you're going you're gonna to do things for God. And if you fear him, you're going to do it God's way. We need that healthy, godly fear, don't we? How do you get it? <laughs> Read your Bibles. <laughs> you'll, get, you'll see what I'm talking about. But ask him, Lord, get, put that fear in my heart. Because you know something? Even when I came to the Lord, you know, I'll be honest with you. You know, I've developed that, that attitude. I don't fear nobody, you know. And it took a while for the Lord to take that from me because that attitude was keeping me, was holding me back from totally surrendering myself to God. But once God began to in, 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 uh, put within me that, that healthy fear of him, <laughs> look where I'm at, you know what I'm saying? So, so, so pray that God would help you to understand God for who he is. He's a God of love. He's also a just God. You hear me? So he had a godly fear that moved him, and that's why you see him building. Noah was a man of faith, and therefore he prepared an ark. Here's the thing that I want you to know for the saving of his household. Notice that. It says, so he was moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, for his family. He obeyed God, built the ark, so that his family might be saved. Oh, man. We can go on a lot in a whole different trail here. You know, we may lose our children because our faith is just an intellectual faith and not a practical living faith, which is obeying God. Do you know that your children know the real you? You can come here and lift your hands and put on that, that you know, that Christian smile. <laughs> you can do all that. You can fool us, man. Trust me, I was, I was a good one. And to my wife, God used my wife to expose me, and pretty much she would say, I want that guy in the pulpit to come home with me already. She knew who I really was. 
My kids knew who I, were, what was, who I was, and I can honestly say that I hurt my kids' faith with my hypocrisy. I'm grateful and thankful that God gave me an opportunity to ask for forgiveness and then to, 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 to continue to live my life, and they see the difference from old, brand new David in Christ, you know, to now David walking with Christ for a while. They see the difference. But I'll tell you this, some of us don't have the faith to obey, and in the process, we're being a false witness to our household. Why not live in such a way you built your, 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 walk, your, your, your Christian walk, and in it, God can use it to reach your children. Remember the Philippian jail, jailer? The Bible says that he, once he got saved, him and his household were saved. Not that they got saved. God, no doubt, probably used this Philippian jailer to bring the gospel. They saw him and they got saved. He became a means for them to accept the gospel. So here's the thing with you. Listen, you might have that intellectual faith, but not that practical faith. And that practical faith is demonstrated by living a life of obedience. As mentioned, your children know the difference. Now, in the Bible, there, there are two men that are contrasts. Noah, who we're talking about, a man who had faith, you know, to believe and, and the faith to, to do and so forth. And then there's another guy by the name of Lot. You guys remember him? Lot. Lot was a miserable, backslidden, saved man <laughs> who moved to Sodom, which was a very wicked place. And in Genesis 19, we saw how God warned Lot, just like he warned Noah, to get his family out of the city, to flee the city, because judgment was is coming and the city was going to be destroyed. Lot tried to witness to his family, but what happened? They mocked him because they, didn't, they, because they saw how he lived. Lot had a saved soul, but lost his family. Don't you love your family? Are you trying to win them by punking them into Christianity? You know, you better come to church with me. You know what I'm talking about? Or are you, or are you reaching them by being an example? Because you can try to reach them with your words, but with your life, you're pushing them further away from God. We need to be like Noah in a sense that he prepared an ark for the saving of his household. We need to build our reputation, our witness, so that our families too can be saved. God is going to save them, but we can be a means in how God can save them. You hear me? May God help us not to be a lot. We should not want to go to heaven without our children. You should not want to go to heaven. Because sometimes, I mean, I was at that point in one time in my life. It was just about me. Me. I'm going to heaven. I'm saved. God is using me. But what about my kids? You know, can I, can I just be very blunt with you guys? I thank God that me and Sonia love God enough to be honest with our family. You know, I'll tell you this. I had to bring my kids into a room, sit them all down, and, and if you've been a bad witness, maybe you can do this. I don't know. You, you pray about it. But I sat them down, and I said, I need to ask all you guys to forgive me for being a bad witness. And they looked at me, oh, I, I forgive you, Dad. No, 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 no. I really need you to forgive me from the bottom of your heart. I'm misrepresenting God to you guys. And all my kids got up and they hugged me and they said, yeah, Dad, <laughs> we forgive you. And I said, thank you. And I said, you know what, guys? I'm trying to get better. I struggle with a lot of anger. And, and I remember, I, and I told them, look, I, and, and if, I, if you see me slipping a little bit, I said, Remind me of this day. And I remember one day I got married with my daughter. And you go, Dad, Dad, remember what you promised. <laughs> and I was like, <gasps> she got me, man. She got me. But they were worth the change. Now when I see them serving God, having their own, you know what a blessing. My, my daughter lives with me right now. She's 19 years old. You know what a blessing it is to walk past her room and you can hear her praying on her own, reading her Bible. She'll come up and say, okay, well, me and Sonia, we're watching something on TV, those forensic files, you know, type of shows. 
and we're watching it, right? And Sammy sat right there, and then she'll get up, and she'll walk up, and she'll say, Dad, Mom, okay, I'm going to go to my room. And I'll be like, where are you going? We're family time, right? And she'll be like, oh, I'm going to go do a study. <laughs> Conviction like crazy, huh? But, but, but you know something, though? She learned from her mom and dad. We set an example. We, we, we taught her. Why? Because when they, can't, when they come to that age for them to make their own decision, guess what? Everything that you implemented through the teaching of the word, through living off the word in their lives, that's going to play a big role in their decision. They're going to say, my parents were hypocrites, or they're going to say, my parents love the Lord. And that's going to help them make that decision. And when they're saved, you're going to be a blessed man. You know something? I've said this before. I don't care if my kids never graduate from college. As long as they're serving God, I am the happiest man on earth. To know that my kids will be with me in heaven is the best thing that I, can, that I want on this earth. I'm a happy man. <laughs> you know? So here's the thing. Do you have that faith of Noah to build whatever it takes? To win your loved ones, to save your loved ones, to put the effort in. Because they're with it. They're worth it. And let me tell you something. I know people that have their children already adults. They don't want nothing to do with God. To you, I will say, keep fighting for them. Don't give up on them. Humble yourselves before them. Strip yourself of pride and shame and all that ugliness that the devil will use to keep you from communicating God's word. And if you have to change just to reach them, change them. They're worth it. Trust me. As long as there's air in their lungs, there's hope. Don't ever give up. Fight for them. Amen? Good. Let's move on to the next one. But you can start by going to them, confessing and asking for forgiveness, as I mentioned. For being a poor Christian. They'll watch you for a while to see if it's real. But trust me, after seeing that it is, the door will open for you to witness to them once again. And it might just be that God will give you that awesome opportunity to witness your children coming to faith. And they're saved. Here's the other one. Noah had faith in a time of great wickedness. He had faith in a time of great wickedness. Noah lived in a wicked society, didn't he? Don't be those that say they can't have faith because of social problems that we face today. Think of the ungodliness and the wickedness that abounded in Noah's time. See, in the times of Noah, according to Genesis 5, 6, 5 through 6, he lived in a time of, quote, secular philosophy, unquote. The King James Version uses the word imagination instead of intent. The word <laughs> imagination there speaks of, it does not mean daydreams, but philosophies. So there was a secular philosophy like we have today in our schools and our universities and in other news outlets. And yet he remained faithful. In his time, it was a time of scientific progress. Noah built a large ship that was able to hold in the hardest storm ever known to man. I mean, it destroyed the whole world. During those great times, uh, those, those, those times, great cities were built. Genesis 4, 17 talks about that. And today we're living in a time, right, of scientific progress. Just look at the world around you, the buildings and everything. And, and not only that, but social media and the Internet. We're progressing. We're progressing in, in these um, scientific uh, ways, lives. In fact, Noah, even in... These times remain faithful during the scientific progress there. Here's another one. In his time, there was social plagues. Genesis chapter 6, verses 11 through 13. Jot that down. Think about the plagues that were in that time. There was drunkenness. There was uh, people just living wickedly in uh, adultery and fornication. Think about today. We have murders, terrorism, kidnapping, human trafficking, child prostitution, the, the murders of innocent babies. There are social plagues today. You can still be faithful to God. In his time, there was sexual perversion. Jesus likened the days of Noah with the days of Lot in Luke chapter 17, 26 to 30. He said that when he returns, he was going, it was going to be like in the days of Noah. Think of how ugly it was. It's ugly today. 
When you go back to Noah's time and you see how, when you read Genesis, you're going to see how the Bible says that, man, that God regretted creating man. It was so wicked. Their intents, their imagination, their philosophy, everything was tore up. God said, I got, I got to put an end to it. And we're living in those days. You know, every, 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 every day I, I tell Sonia, oh, I was reading in the news or I was watching the news, and this guy went into in Sacramento, killed, you know, six people and shot a bunch of people. And I'll go, I think it was Cancun, uh, this guy walked into a, a dance club and, and shot and killed 20 people. And she's like, man, I don't want to hear that stuff no more, you know. But, but I tell her, hey, listen, you, we have to be aware of what's going on around us. The abortions is at a high level right now. You know, everyone's committing abortion. We're driving up and we're talking about it. You know how right now we're doing a ministry where Sonia and a few other ladies are going to these abortion clinics and they're standing up and offering hope to these young ladies. I mean, dude, it is wicked. We're in a wicked place. Just like in the days of Lot. And yet he remained faithful. Wickedness was great in Noah's day. And Noah still lived righteously, and he preached the word. Notice it back in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, it says, by which he condemned the world. He was still preaching the message and the warnings of God. The people in Noah's time didn't listen, but Noah still preached. He still preached. We don't know how long, but he preached. In fact, when I was seeing there, I Googled, how long did it take for Noah to build the ark? They didn't have the answer. So I don't have an answer for you. <laughs> but I know it was for a long time. And him working, he was preaching through his life. I'm sure he warned the people. He did. He was still preaching. Even when everything was falling apart, he had that faith to preach. So what am I saying? Listen, I'll tell you this. There were those that didn't listen. In fact, only his family did. <laughs> and it just shows us that even when we preach, people are not going to listen. But it doesn't mean you're not being successful in your faithfulness to God. You see, we don't measure preaching success by numbers. Think of Jesus Christ. When he preached, <laughs> he preached crowds away, didn't he? Some got saved, but many rejected him. It's been rightly said that it is not a preacher's job to fill the auditorium, but to fill the pulpit and preach the word of God. Hear me? It, we're not here to... To be celebrities and, you know, Christian celebrities, you know, pastors. We're like, nah, man, I can care less about this. My heart is to be faithful and to preach the message, the message that God put in my heart. I'm sitting there and I'm praying, God, I said, help me to communicate your message, the message that you have for every single person here. That's what Noah was doing. He was faithfully preaching the message. So, Notice his by, by, by which he condemned the world. So he was faithful in preaching. And there, uh, be just uh, think about it. If they didn't receive Jesus' message, they're not going to receive you, but God will. You'll receive your faithfulness to him, and he will bless you when you stand before him and you hear him say, well done. Amen? So Noah preached the word as he did the work. <laughs> and here's the other one in, in closing. Noah had a faith that, re, that received well. It says... He became an heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. His legacy was righteousness. He was made righteous in the sight of the Lord by faith. In Hebrews 10, 38, we read that the just shall live by faith, and he did. We know that we are made righteous when we receive Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for he who knew us and became sent for us, that we become the righteousness of God. Right? Noah, know that Noah wasn't saved by works. He was saved by the grace of God. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 8, you will read that. It was grace, the grace of God. This is the first time the word grace is used in the Old Testament. That's awesome right there. But I want you to know that he went through a hard time. He went through the headaches, the pain, the difficulties of building the ark. And as people mocked him, it cost him something. For him to build the ark, it cost him something. But the end result was a blessing. He and his family were saved. And God was honored. Think about it. He went into the ark as a poor person, but he came out only in the earth. <laughs> he went into the ark in a minority, but he came out the majority. He went in by faith, and he came out being faithful. 
His faithfulness allowed him to make it to the hall of faith as one of the champions of faith. So here's my thing to you. How do you want to be remembered? As a champion of faith? Or do you want to be some, known as someone who's a hypocrite? When you, when, you're, when you die and people come up and talk about you, are they going to be like this? He was good. Good cook. He can cook some good huevos, man, con tortilla. His Kool-Aid. You know how to put sugar in there, man. Or are they going to say he had faith? He was a man of faith. He loved the Lord. He was a champion of faith, of the faith. The ark is an illustration of salvation, you see. It's a picture of Jesus. The ark is finished, and just before the flood came, God caused Noah into the ark, Genesis 7, 1. And God was there, and he was the one, if you remember, who shut the door. I want you to know that the ark was sealed on the inside as well as in the outside with a substance called pitch, which is the same word translated atonement in the Old Testament. God put atonement on the outside and on the inside, and not one drop of water could come through. It's a picture of what will happen when someone comes to Jesus. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Once we do, God shuts the door, and those in Christ are sealed by the spirit of promise. And not one drop of his judgment will come to the child of God who is saved, who is saved safely in Christ. The question now is this. Are you in the ark? Are you in Christ? Are you saved? The door is open. And if you come in, you will experience the blessings that God has for you. But if you stay out, remember, one day the door will shut. And I pray you're not on that side of the door.